Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne Young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset into the street of Salem Village, but put his head back after crossing the threshold to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife, and Faith, as the wife was abruptly named, thrust her own pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with her with the pink ribbons of her cap. As she called to Goodman Brown, dearest heart, she whispered she, softly rather, sadly, when her lips were close to his ear, pry thee, put off your journey until sunrise, and sleep in your own bed tonight. A lone woman is troubled with such dreams and such thoughts, and she's afeard of herself. Sometimes, pray tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights in the year. My love and my faith, replied young Goodman Brown, of all nights in this year, this one night must I carry away from thee. My journey is thou callest it forth and back again, must needs to be done twixt now and sunrise. What my sweet pretty wife dost thou doubt me already, and we but three months married. Then God bless you, said Faith, uh, with the pink ribbons, and may you find all well when you come back. Amen, cried Goodman Brown. Say that say thy prayers, dear Faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. So they parted, and the young man pursued his way, until, being about to turn the corner by the meeting house, he looked back and saw the head of Faith still peeping after him, with a melancholy air, in spite of her pink ribbons. Poor little Faith, thought she, thought he, for his heart smote him. What a wrench I am to leave her on such an errand. She talks of dreams, too. Methought, as she spoke, there was trouble in her faith, as if a dream had warned, warned her that work is to be done tonight. But no, no, t'would kill her to think it. Well, she's blessed angel on earth, and after this one night, I'll cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. With his excellent resolve for the future, Goodman Brown felt himself justified in making more haste on his present evil purpose. He had taken a dreary road, darkened by the gloomiest trees of the forest, which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through, and closely immediately behind. It was all as lonely as it could be, and there is this peculiarity in such a solitude that the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may be yet passing through an unseen multitude. There may be a devilish Indian behind every tree, said Goodman Brown to himself, and he glanced fearfully behind him as he added, What if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? His head be being turned back, he passed a crook in the road, and looking forward again beheld the figure of a man in grave and decent attire seated at the foot of an old tree. He arose at Goodman Brown's approach and walked onward side by side with him. You are late, Goodman Brown, said he. The clock of the old south is striking as I came through Boston, and that is full fifteen minutes agone. Faith kept me back a while, replied the young man, with a tremor in his voice caused by the sudden appearance of his companion, though not wholly unexpected. It was now deep dusk in the forest, and the deepest in that part of it where these two were journeying, as nearly as could be discerned. The second traveler was about fifty years old, apparently in the same rank of life as Goodman Brown, and bearing a considerable resemblance to him, though perhaps more in expression than features. Still, they might have been taken for father and son, and yet, though the elder person was simply clad as the younger, and as simply in manner too, he had an indescribable air of, some, of one who knew the world. I would not have felt abashed in, at the governor's dinner table, or in King William's court, were it possible after his affairs should call him thither. But the only thing about him that could be fixed upon as remarkable was his staff, which wore the likeness of a great black snake, so curiously wrought that it might almost be seen to twist 
and wriggle itself like a lively serpent, like a living serpent. This, of course, must have been an ocular deception, assisted by the uncertain light. Come, Goodman Brown, cried his fellow traveler. This is a dull place for the beginning of a journey. Take my staff, if you are so, if you are so soon weary. Friends, said the other, exchanging his slow pace for a full stop, having kept covenant by meeting, be here. It is my purpose now to return whence I came. I have scruples touching the matter, though, what's of? Sayest thou so, replied he of the serpent, smiling apart. Let us walk on, nevertheless, reasoning as we go. And if I convince thee not, thou shalt turn back. But we are but a little way in the forest yet. Too far, too far, exclaimed the good man, unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs, and I shall be the first name of Brown that ever took this path and kept such good co such company, though, would say, observed by the older el older person. Interrupting his pause, well, said Goodman Brown, I have been as well acquainted with your family as we ever a one among the Puritans, and that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, while he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem, and it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot, kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's War. They are my good friends, both and I, and many a pleasant walk have we had along the path. I return merrily after midnight. I would fain be friends with you for their sake. If it be as thou sayest, replied Goodman Brown, I marvel they never spoke of these matters, or verily, I marvel not, seeing that the least rumor of the sort would have driven them from New England. We are a people of prayer and the good works to boot, and abide no such wicked wickedness. Wickedness or not, said the traveler with the twisted staff. I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me. The selectmen of Devers Town made me their chairman, and a majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest. The governor and I, too, but these are state secrets. Can this be so? cried Goodman Brown, with a stare of amazement at his undisturbed companion. How be it? Have nothing to do with the governor and council. They have their own ways and are no rule for a simple husband men like me. But were I to go on with thee, how should I meet the eye of that good old man, our minister at Salem Village? Oh, his voice would make me tremble, both Sabbath day and lecture day. Thus far the elder traveler had listened with due gravity, but now burst into a fit of irrepressible mirth, shaking himself so violently that his snake-like staff actually seemed to wriggle in sympathy. Ha ha ha, he shouted he, again and again, and then composed himself, well, go on, Goodman Brown, go on, but pray thee, don't kill me with laughing. Well then, to end the matter at once, said Goodman Brown, considerably nettled, there is my wife, Faith, it would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Nay, if that be the case, answered the other, in go thy ways. Goodman Brown, I would not for twenty old women like the one hobbling before us that faith should come to any harm. As he spoke, he pointed his staff at a female figure on the path, in whom Goodman Brown recognized a very pious and exemplary dame, whom, who had taught him his catechism in youth, and was still moral and spiritual advisor, jointly with the minister and deacon Guggen. A marvel, truly, that goody Cloyce would be so far in the wilderness at nightfall, said he. But with your leave, friend, I shall take a cut through the woods until we have 
left this Christian woman behind. Being a stranger to you, she might ask whom I was consorting with and whither I was going. Be it so, said his fellow traveler, to take you to the woods and let me keep the path. Accordingly, the young man turned aside, but took care to watch his companion, who advanced softly along the road till he had come within a staff length of the old dame. She, meanwhile, was making the best of her way with singular speed for so aged a woman, and bumbling some undistinct words, a prayer, doubtless, as she went. The traveler put forth his staff and touched her withered neck with what seemed the serpent's tail. The devil screamed the pious old lady. Then Goody Clois knows her old friend, observed the traveler, confronting her and leaning on his writhing stick. Ah, forsooth, and it is your worship indeed, cried the old dame. I mean, cried the good dame. Yet yeah, truly is it. And in the very image of my own gossip, Goodman Brown, the grandfather of the silly fellow now is. But would your worship believe it? My broomstick hath strangely disappeared, stolen, as I suspect, by the unhanged witch, Goody Corey, that, and that too, when I was all anointed with the ju juice of small edge and sink foil and wolfsbane, mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe, said the shape of Old Goodman Brown. Ah, your worship knows the recipe, cried the old lady, cackling aloud. So as I was saying, being all ready for the meeting, and no horse to ride on, I made up my mind to foot it, and they tell me there is a nice young man to be taken into communion tonight, but now your good worship will lend me your arm, and we shall be there in the twinkling. That can hardly be, he answered her friend. I may not swear I may not spare you my arm, Goody Cloyce, but here is my staff, if you will. So saying he threw it down at her feet, where perhaps it assumed life, being one of the rods which its owner had formerly lent to the Egyptian Magi. Of this fact, however, Goodman Brown could not take cognizance. He had cast up his eyes in astonishment and looking down again beheld neither Goody Cloyce nor the serpentine staff, but his fellow traveler alone, who waited for him as calmly as if nothing had happened. That old woman taught me my catechism, said the young man, and there was a world of meaning in that simple comment. They continued to walk onward, while the elder traveler exhorted his companion to make good speed and persevere in the path discoursing so aptly that his arguments seemed rather to spring up in the bosom of his auditor than to be suggested by himself. As they went, he plucked the branch of maple to serve for a walking stick and began to strip it of the twigs and little bows, which were wet with evening dew. The moment his fingers touched them, they became strangely, strangely withered and dried up, as with a weak sunshine. Thus the pair proceeded at a good free pace until suddenly, in a gloomy hollow on the road, Goodman Brown sat himself down at the stump of a tree and refused to go any farther. Friend, said he, stubbornly, my mind is made up. Not another step will I budge on this errand. What if a wretched old woman do choose to go to the devil when I thought she was going to heaven? Is that any reason why I should quit my dear faith and go after her? You will think better of this by and by, said his acquaintance composedly. Sit here, go rest yourself a while, and then you feel like moving again. This is my staff to help you move along. Without more words, he threw his companion the maple stick and was as speedily out of sight as if he had vanished into the deepening gloom. The young man sat there for a few moments by the roadside, applauding himself greatly and thinking with how clear a conscience he should meet the minister in his morning walk, nor shrink from the eye of a good old deacon Guggen. Well, calm sleep would be his that very night, which was to have been spent so wickedly, but purely and sweet now, in the arms of faith, 
amidst these pleasant and praiseworthy meditations. Goodman Brown heard the tramp of horses along the road and deemed it advisable to conceal himself within the verge of the forest. Conscious of the guilty purpose he had brought him thither, though now so happily turned from it. On came the hoof tramps and the voices of the riders, two grave old voices conversing soberly as they drew near. These mingled sounds appeared to pass along the road, within a few yards of the young man's hiding place, but owing doubtless to the depth of the gloom at that particular spot, neither of the travelers nor their steeds were visible, though their figures brushed the small bows up by the wayside. It could not be seen that they intercepted even for a moment. The faint gleam from the strip of the bright sky athwart which they must have passed. Goodman Brown alternately crouched and stood on tiptoe, pulling aside the branches and thrusting forth his head as far as he durst, without discerning as much as a shadow. It vexed him the more, because he could have sworn, were such a thing possible, that he recognized the voices of the minister and deacon Gugan jogging all, along quietly as they were to do when bound to some ordation or ecclesiastical council, while yet within hearing, one of the riders stopped to pluck a switch. Of the two, Reverend Sir, said the voice like the deacons, I had rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting. They tell me that some of our community are to be here from Falmouth and beyond and others from Connecticut and Rhode Island, besides several of the Indian powwows who, after their fashion, know almost as much deviltry as the rest of us, as the best of us. Moreover, there is good, there's a goodly young woman to be taken into communion. Mighty well, Deacon Guggen, replied the solemn tones of the minister. Spur up or we shall be late. Nothing can be done, you know, until I get on the ground. Hoofs clattered again, and the voices talking so strangely in the empty air passed on through the forest, while no church had ever been gathered, no solitary Christian prayed whither. Then could these holy men be journeying so deep into the heathen wilderness, young Goodman Brown caught hold of a tree for support, being ready to sink down on the ground, faint and overburthened, with a heavy sickness in his heart, he looked up to the sky, doubting whether there was a heaven above him. Yet there was a blue arc and the stars brightening in it. With heaven above and faith below, I will yet stand firm against the devil, cried Goodman Brown. Well, he still gazed upward into the deep arc of the firmament and lifted his hands to pray a cloud, though no wind was stirring hurried across the zenith and hid the brightening stars. The blue sky was still visible, except directly overhead, where this black mass of cloud was sweeping swiftly northward, aloft in the air as if from the depths of the cloud came a confused and doubtful sound of voices. Once the listener fancied that he could distinguish the accent of the townspeople of his own, men and women, both pious and ungodly, many of whom had met at the communion table and had seen others rioting at the tavern. The next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught but the murmur of the old forest whispering without the wind. Then came a stronger swell of those familiar tones, heard daily in the sunshine at Salem Village, but never until now from a cloud of night. There was one voice of a young woman uttering lamentations. It was an uncertain sorrow and entreating for some favor, which perhaps it would grieve her to obtain. And all the unseen multitude, both saints and sinners, seemed to encourage her onward. Faith, shouted Goodman Brown, is a voice of agony and desperation, and the echoes, in, in a voice of agony and desperation, that the echoes of the forest mocked him, crying, Faith, Faith, as if bewildered stretches of were seeking her all through the wilderness. The cry of grief, rage, and terror was yet piercing the night when the unhappy husband held his breath for response. There was a scream 
drowned immediately in the louder murmur of voices fading into the far-off laughter, as if the dark clouds swept away, leaving the clear and silent sky above Goodman Brown. But something fluttered lightly down through the air and caught on the branch of a tree. The young man seized it and beheld a pink ribbon. My faith is gone, cried he, after one stupefied moment. There was no good on earth. And sin is but a name, come devil, for to thee is this world given. And maddened with despair, so that he laughed loud and long, did Goodman Brown grasp his staff and set forth again at such a rate that he seemed to fly along the forest path rather than to walk or run. The road grew wilder and drearier and more faintly traced and vanished at length, leaving him in the heart of the dark wilderness, still rushing onward. And the instinct that guides mortal men to evil. The whole forest was peopled with frightful sounds and creaking of the trees, the howling of the wild beasts and the yell of Indians, while sometimes the wind tolled like a distant church bell and sometimes gave a broad roar around the traveler, as if all nature were laughing him to scorn. But he was by himself the chief horror of the scene and shrank not from its other's horrors. Ha ha ha, roared Goodman Brown when the wind laughed at him. Let us hear which will laugh loudest. Think not to frighten me with your deviltry. Come witch, come wizard, come Indian powwow, come devil himself. And here comes Goodman Brown. You may as well fear him as he fears you. In truth, all through the haunted forest there could be nothing more frightening than the figure of Goodman Brown when he flew among the black pines, brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures, now giving vent to the inspiration of horrid blasphemy, and now shouting forth such laughter as set all the echoes of the forest laughing like demons around him. The fiend in his own shape is less hideous than when he rages in the breast of man. Thus sped the demoniac on his course until, until, quivering among the trees, he saw a red light before him, as when he felled trunks and branches of a clearing have been set on fire, and threw up their lurid blaze against the sky at hour of midnight. He paused in a lull of the tempest that had driven him onward, and heard the swell of what seemed like a hymn, rolling solemnly from a distance with the weight of many voices. He knew the tune. It was a familiar one in the choir of the village meeting house. The verse died heavily away and was lengthened by a chorus, not of human voices, but of all the sounds of the benighted and wilderness, pealing in awful harmony together. Gibbon Brown cried out, and his cry was lost to his own ear by its unison with the cry of the desert. In the interval of silence, he stole forward until the light glared full upon his eyes at one extremity of an open space, hemmed in by the dark wall of the forest arose a rock, bearing some rude natural resemblance either to an altar or a pulpit and surrounded by four blazing pines, their tops aflame, their stems untouched like candles at an evening meeting. The mass of foliage that had overgrown the summit of the rock was all on fire, blazing high into the night and fitfully illuminating the whole field. Each pendant twig and leafy festoon was in a blaze. As the red light arose and fell, numerous congregation alternately shone forth, then disappeared in sh shadow and again grew, as, as it were, out of the darkness, peopling the heart of the solitary woods at once. A grave and dark clad company quoth Goodman Brown. In truth, they were such, among them quivering to and fro, between gloom and splendor, appeared faces that would be seen next day at the council board of the province, and others which, Sabbath after Sabbath, looked devoutly heavenward and benightedly over the crowded pews. From the holiest pupits in the land, some affirmed that the lady of the governor was there, at least there were high names well known to her, the wives of the honored husbands, the widow and widows, a great multitude, 
and ancient maidens, all of excellent repute, and fair young girls, who, re who trembled lest their mothers should epsy them. Either the sudden gleams of light flashing over the obscure field bedazzled Goodman Brown, or he recognized the score of the church members of Salem Village, famous for their especial sanctity. Good old Deacon Guggen had arrived and waited at the skirts of that vul vul venerable saint and his, his reverend pastor, but irreverently consorting with these grave, reputable, and pious people, these elders of the church, these chaste dames, and dewy virgins, they were men in dissolute, of dissolute lives, and women of spotted fame. Wretches given over to all mean and filthy vice, and suspected even of horrid crimes, it was strange to see that the good shrank not from the wicked, nor were the sinners abashed by the saints. Scattered also among their pale-faced enemies were the Indian priests, or powwows, who had often scared their native, who had scarred their native forests with more hideous incantations than any known to English witchcraft. But where is faith? thought Goodman Brown, and as hope came to his heart, he trembled. Another verse of the hymn arose, a slow and mournful strain, such as the pious love, but joined to words which expressed all that our nature can conceive of sin, and darkly hinted at, at far more. Unfathomable to mere mortals is the lore of fiends. Verse after verse was sung, and still the chorus of the desert swelled between like the deepest tone of a mighty organ. And with the final peal of that dreadful anthem, there came a sound, as if the roaring wind, the rushing streams, and the howling beasts, and every other voice of the unconverted wilderness, were mingling and according to the voice of guilty men, in homage to the Prince of All. The four blazing pines threw up a loftier flame, and obscurely discovered shapes and vis visages of horror of smoke wreaths above the impious assembly. At the same moment, the fire on the rock short shot fledly forth, redly forth and formed a growing, glowing arc above its base, where now appeared a figure, with reverence be it spoken. The figure bore no sight, slight similitude, both in garb and manner, to both grave divine of the New England churches. Bring forth the converts, cried a voice, that echoed through the field, rolled into the forest. At the word Goodman Brown stepped forth from a shadow of the from the shadow of the trees and approached the congregation, with whom he felt a loathful brotherhood, by the sympathy of all that was wicked in his heart. He could have well nigh sworn at the shape of his own Dead father beckoned him to advance, looking downward from a smoke wreath, while a woman with dim features of despair threw out her hand to warn him back. Was it his mother? But he had no power to retreat one step, nor to resist, even in thought, when the minister and good old Deacon Gugan seized his arms and led him to the blazing rock. Thither came also the slender form of a veiled female, led between Good, goody Clois, that pious teacher of the Catechism, and Martha Carrier, who had received the devil's promise to be queen of hell, a, rap, a rampant hag was she. And there stood the proselytes beneath the canopy of fire. Welcome, my children, said the dark figure, to the communion of your race. Ye have found thus young, your nature, and your destiny. My children look behind you. They turned and flashing forth, as it were, in a sheet of flame. The fiend worshippers were seen. A smile of unwelcome gleamed, a smile of welcome gleamed darkly on every visage. There resumed the stable form. Are all whom ye have reverenced from youth, ye deemed them holier than yourselves and shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with their lives of righteousness. 
and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here are they all in my worshiping assembly. This night it shall be granted you to know their secret deeds, how hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households, how many a woman eager for widow's weeds has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom, how beardless youth have made haste to inherit their father's wealth, and how fair damsels, blush not sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden and bidden me, the sole guest, to an infant's funeral. By the sympathy of your human hearts for sin, ye shall send out all the places, whether in church, bedchamber, street, field, or forest, where crime has been committed, and shall exult to behold the whole, world, the whole earth, one stain of guilt, one mighty blood spot. Far more than this, it shall be yours to penetrate in every bosom the deep mystery of sin, the fountain of all wicked arts, and which inexhaustibly supplies more evil impulses than human power, than my power at its utmost can make manifest in deeds, and now my children look upon each other. They did so, and by the blaze of the hell-kindled torches, the wretched man beheld his faith and the wife of her husband trembling before that unhallowed altar. Lo, there ye stand, my children, said the figure, in a deep and solemn tone, almost sad with its disappearing awfulness, as if he, as if his once angelic nature could yet mourn our miserable race, depending upon one's another's hearts, and ye had still hoped that virtue were not all a dream. Now are ye undeceived? Evil is the nature of mankind. Evil must be your only happiness. Welcome again, my children, to the communion of your race. Welcome, repeated the fiend worshippers in one cry of despair and triumph. And there they stood, the only pair, as it seemed, who were yet hesitating on the verge of wickedness in the dark world. A basin was hollowed naturally in the rock. Did it contain water reddened by the lurid light? Or was it blood? Or pensions? A liquid flame? Herein did the shape of evil dip his head, and prepare to lay the mark of baptism upon their foreheads, that they might be partakers of the mystery of sin, more conscious of the secret guilt of others, both in deed and thought, than they could be of their own. The husband cast one look at his pale wife, and faith at him, what polluted wretches would the next glance show them to each other, shuddering, a, shuddering alike at what they disclosed and what they saw? Faith, faith, cried her, the husband. Look up to heaven and resist the wicked one. Whether faith obeyed, he knew not. Hardly had he spoken when he found himself uh, amid the calm night in solitude listening to a roar of the wind which died heavily away through the forest. He staggered against the rock and felt it chill and damp, while a hanging twig that had been all on fire besprinkled his cheek with the coldest dew. The next morning, young Goodman Brown came slowly into the street of Salem Village, staring around him like a bewildered man. The good old minister was taking a walk along the graveyard to get an appetite for breakfast and meditate his sermon and bestowed a blessing as he passed on Goodman Brown. He shrank from the venerable saint as if to void an anathema. Old Deacon Gookin was at domestic worship and the holy words of his prayer were heard through the open window. What God doth the wizard pray to, quoth Goodman Brown. Goody Cloyce, that excellent old Christian, stood in the early sunshine at her own lattice, catechizing a little girl who had brought her a pint of morning's milk. Goodman Brown snatched away the child as from the grasp of the fiend himself, turning the corner by the meeting house 
he spied the head of faith with the pink ribbons gazing anxiously forth and bursting into such joy at sight of him that she skipped along the street and almost kissed her husband before the whole village. But Goodman Brown looked sternly and sadly into her face and passed on without a greeting. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? Be it so, if you will. But alas, it was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown, a stern, a sad, a darkly meditative, a distrustful, if not a desperate man, did he become from the night of that fearful dream on the Sabbath day when the congregation were singing a holy palm psalm. He could not listen because an anthem of sin rushed loudly upon his ear and drowned all the blessed strain. When the minister spoke from the pulpit with power and fervid eloquence and with his hand on the open Bible, of the sacred truths of our religion and of saint-like lives and triumphant deaths and a future bliss of misery unutterable and then did Goodman Brown turn pale dreading lest the roof should thunder down upon the gray blasphemer and his heroes often awaking suddenly at midnight he shrank from the bosom of faith and at morning of, or eventide when the faith when, when the family knelt down at prayer he scowled and muttered to himself and gazed sternly at his wife and turned away. And when he had lived long, was born to his grave, a horsey corpse, bestowed by faith an age woman and children and grandchildren, a goodly procession. Besides neighbors, not a few, they carved no hopeful verse upon his tombstone, for his dying hour was gloom. And that's the end of Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I thought that was a good story. Um, so now is my period part where I comment about the story or what I thought about it. Um, it reminded me a lot of the movie called The, the Witch. Mo reminded me a lot of the movie called The Witch, where he, um, I think all the characters in the movie, um, like, they have, like, these, they're, like, starving, and they have, like, these dreams in, in like, a forest or a field or whatever, whatever. they're wandering around looking looking for food, and they're starving, and, and, and they have these dreams of witches, and every member of the family has a dream of a different type of witch. Like, um, I just I don't, remember, I don't know what all the witches were, but I remember, I remember the. There was like a twelve-year-old boy. He had a dream of like, a witch that was like really well well endowed. I guess you could say she was like really attractive. She was like a really attractive witch, and his 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 twelve-year-old view his his dream of a witch was like really attractive, and that was his. And, and he was afraid of, you know, you know, lust or whatever. And that, and that, that was, I guess, I don't know if he was, he was dying in the, in, in that moment or I don't know how they'd, most of them, most of the members of the family didn't survive. And then I think the girl that was like three years older than him had a dream of a witch that was, um, like a really old woman, really old witch with wrinkly skin and was really just look really aged. Um, and so I guess her deepest fear was getting old and losing her beauty. And there was, um, so like every member of the family had like a different witch. Um, and then the father had a dream of a witch that was, I, again, I saw this movie like five years ago, so I don't remember all the details, but the father had a, had a dream of a witch that was like, um, she she intended harm she i think she intended some she had like superpowers she had like evil witchcraft powers that could hurt him or his family and that could cause pain and he was worried about a witch that could have uh evil powers that could cause pain and then who who else had dreams there was there was a there was one or two other members of the family who had dreams of a witch 
but you know when you're when you're um what's the word when you're um poor and when you're going through troubles you think about evil in a lot of ways and you think about um people just you know, doing these incantations of evil in a forest and like you're, you're desperate and you don't know where to go and I, I don't totally get the story like I've I'm not a very good reader like um, what's it called Mr. Goodman Brown or whatever it's called I don't totally know understand the story because I, I especially when I think this is written in like the 19th century or around the 19th century so like it's a little bit harder to read older stories like that for me it's like I don't totally get it but it just it reminded me of the movie The Witch, and I, I was thinking about the movie The Witch before they even said, "Oh, he he might have been sleeping and dreamed the whole thing up." I I that I was thinking I was thinking about that movie before the story said that, because um, I just thought, "Oh, that's such a like the Indian chiefs along with the the witches and stuff." Oh man, it's just like, come on, that's too much. <laughs> That's too much for... That's not a realistic story. He's dreaming it. Anytime a story is too weird, you know they're dreaming it. Because weird stuff like that doesn't happen in real life. Real life is... There's bad stuff that happens in real life, but not weird stuff like witches and, you know, chanting with Indian chiefs. That's not... That's not what you normally see. Um, come on now. Um, but... I mean, there is witchcraft in real... I mean, there are witches in real life. Wicca is like a real religion. Yeah, I don't know if it's a spirituality or if it's a religion, but Wic Wicca, Wicca, Wiccans are real. They're not like they are in these stories, but or like the Wicked Witch of the West. They're not like the Wizard of Oz or whatever, but they're, Wiccans do exist in real life. It's just funny how like the, the 19th century and like the 16th century and all those olden times and the, even the Middle Ages and stuff, they used to ha tell all these stories about people who weren't good Christians and all these evil spells they could put under people and and all these like um like anything that wasn't christian was wicked and there was this obsession with evil and wicked this wicked this wicked 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 and there's an obsession with evil back then because they didn't understand a lot of the complexities of the world they didn't understand a lot of the focus of human mischief and misdeeds and they didn't understand that how difficult a how difficult the world could be that when you're starving you're gonna have um what's the word you're going to have um or when you're really lost you could have not a fantasy but a i read this word on twitter yesterday i, I forgot the word it's just 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 like visions of like, like when you feel like you're gonna pass out, you sometimes like see like a mirage or something before you pass out. Not that I've ever passed out before, but not normally. But um, uh, there, there's a medical term for all of these feelings that you feel. It's just funny how in the 19th century, before they invented all these medical terms for these different emotions and different things you could going on with your life, they everything was either good or wicked. Mr. Goodman. Or the wicked witches in the forest. It's always Mr. Goodman or the wicked witches. In the, everything was defined by good and evil. There wasn't medical definition. Hallucination. Hallucin hallu hallucination is the word I'm looking for. Like sometimes when you feel like you're going to pass out, you f have hallucinations. And that's a medical term. That's a medical term. But like, I, I guess you feel things like that before you die. You get hallucinations before you die. But it's just... I don't know, I guess that's part of life, and we do experience that today. People still experience that today before they die. It's just, or who knows, but I don't really understand the whole ending of the story, but it's, it's hard to read these older stories, but I'm a pretty bad reader anyway, so. So I thought of the movie um, The Witch from 2016, the movie from five years ago. I thought of that movie. He must have read this story and wrote, made the movie sort of like the story. I don't know, but that's what I got from the story. Um. It's similar to the movie of the witch. Um, of course, this story was written hundreds of years before the movie was made. So I'm not saying, you know what I mean, right? So, um, uh, 
yeah, I thought it was a good story. I like the details. I like when stories talk about good and evil because I, I sometimes feel like I don't like reading the Bible anymore because you get a lot of garbage in the Bible, but I still like reading people who are like interested in good and evil. So I still like people, I, I'm, I, I think, I think there's more gray area in life than good and evil. So I don't, I don't um, view life like that, but I think it's cool that people are that religious. I, I think religious people are cool. I don't have any problems with them, but it's just like, I, I like reading stories of people who are like super religious and like not very well educated. <laughs> And different, and different, and viewed life very unscientifically, and viewed it, and had a lot of hallucinations of you know, fantasy and science fiction, all this. Anyways, I th I think that's an interesting story, and I I like the cane that that looked like it was going to turn into a snake, the serpent's cane. I like that, the, the serpent staff. I thought that was cool. <laughs> that's like a cool fantasy story. I, I I've seen that like in TV shows before, movies like a staff that can turn into a serpent staff. That, that that's a cool idea. I I like that idea. I like I like how the forest was so desolate and like the trees were like hanging over them like in Snow White when Snow White was wa walking through the forest and all the trees were reaching out for her and hanging over her and yeah, I, I like how that people get all these ideas from each other. Like they the person who made Snow White in 1936, Walt Disney or whoever made that and whoever helped Walt Disney made that movie. He probably read this story and took ideas from this story and put them in the Snow White, even though Snow White was written by, was it Hans Christian Andersen or was that somebody else? I don't know. Somebody like Hans Christian Andersen, probably around the same time Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote this story. And Walt Disney put the two together and made his movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1936. I'm guessing, I'm talking out of my butt, but it just might have happened. I, I, I made those connections, but I don't know. I, I might be making it up. Who knows? Let me know in the comments below what you thought of um, the story, uh, Young Goodman Brown. Uh, let me know what you thought of the story in the comments below. Please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. And please like this video. It really helps out the channel a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.